Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Emma Kogornoyu. Emma earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Penn State University, where she carried out undergraduate research in the group of Professor Joseph Cortruvo. She subsequently worked as a post-baccalaureate fellow at the National Institute of Drug Abuse through an intramural research training award. Currently, she's pursuing her PhD in the group of Professor Marvin Parisram at New York University. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Emma. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the introduction and for having me today. I'm excited to talk about our lab's most recent work on photo-induced oxidative cleavage of alkenes. Alkenes are one of the most important chemical feedstocks due to their widespread availability and their diverse reactivity. Included in this reactivity is oxidation. There are many ways to oxidize alkenes, such as epoxidation, dihydroxylation, and importantly, oxidative cleavage to yield valuable carbonyl compounds. Carbonyls are heavily featured in natural products and in pharmaceutical drugs. However, these traditional methods for cleavage are wrought with low selectivity, highly oxidative conditions that produce toxic waste and usually require multiple steps. Ozonolysis, otherwise referred to as the Kriege reaction, is one of the most commonly used methods, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, to do oxidative cleavage of alkenes. The reaction occurs through a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition that then fragments to yield these intermediates, which then do a second cycloaddition event to give ozonide, which upon reductive conditions will give you your desired aldehyde and ketone products. As mentioned on the previous slide, ozonolysis is not perfect. It has poor alkene selectivity. You need an ozone generator, which in turn makes it difficult to control the stoichiometry and above all else is extremely explosive. An example of its explosive nature occurred in 2003 at an Austrian pharmaceutical plant. They were conducting this ozonolysis reaction when two tanks and two columns exploded, creating a fireball with a diameter of 80 meters injuring over 20 workers. Luckily, no one had died, but as you can see, the damage was extensive and reached as far as 150 meters from the explosion. But if ozonolysis is so dangerous, why is it so widely used? Well, it's because it works, and it works reliably well on large scales, such as this 17 kilogram scale synthesis for this dopamine D2 receptor antagonist. As I mentioned on the previous slide, ozonolysis is considered a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition. The reason why ozonolysis is so reliable and works so well is because its activation barrier is really low. It's only 2.1 kilocal per mole. As you change the central atom to nitrogen or sulfur, you significantly increase that activation barrier to create that cycloadduct. I mentioned in my title, I'll be talking about nitroarenes. However, as you can see, the activation barrier is quite high to form the cycloadduct, which is called a dioxazolidine. How have people been able to overcome this barrier in the past? The 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition of nitro compounds can be thermally promoted with extremely high temperatures, and the dioxazolidine is not stable, which then proceeds to the cleavage product. Buki and I reported in the 1950s that the cycloaddition can be promoted with UV light to get a 10% combined yield of the cleavage products as well as an azobenzene byproduct. And just as in the thermal condition, the dioxazolidine was not stable or isolatable. However, ODA in the 1990s was able to use this strained adamantyl alkene to isolate the cycloaddition adduct and characterize it by X-ray crystallography. However, these photochemical methods used harsh UV light with broadband emission and was not synthetically useful due to the low efficiency. We were curious to know if we could promote this reaction with visible light instead of UV light and still go through that key dioxazolidine intermediate to give us our desired carbonyl products. If we were able to accomplish this, we would be developing a safe to handle method under anaerobic conditions, producing only benign byproducts. Our seed result was with diphenylethylene, and we were able to get a hit. We began our optimization with modifying our nitro area. We switched our substrate to 4-fluorostyrene, as the fluorine would be a good handle for NMR yields. 
You can see here in this Hammett plot that as you increase the electron withdrawing capabilities at the para substituent, you increase the reaction yield. Based on our screen, we went with 4-cyanonitrobenzene. After optimizing the rest of our parameters shown here, now using 390 nanometer light, we began our substrate scope. In our styrenal scope, we tested the various substitution patterns such as ortho, meta, and para. As you can see, all the substitution patterns were well tolerated, and I would like to highlight a couple of key functional groups that normally would be difficult for ozonolysis, such as free hydroxyl groups, carboxylic acids, B-pins, and amines. The free amines struggled, however, the Bach-protected counterpart got a boost in the yield. In addition, halogens were well tolerated, which is great as they are good handles for further functionalization along with B-pin. We also tested other styrene substrates, including different ring sizes and tri-substituted benzophenone derivatives, such as these ones, with all good yields. When it came to our aliphatic substrate scope, we did suffer in our yields due to the fact that they are unactivated substrates. We also tested a handful of other aliphatic substrates, such as cis-cyclooctene and carvone, and were able to get decent yields. We moved on to more complex substrates, such as these three here, which all feature another potential site of reactivity. As you can see, we were able to get really good yields with selectivity favoring the activated alkene. We then wanted to compare our method directly to reported ozonolysis yields. Here on the left, we have a cytotoxic drug featuring this quinoline heterocycle and an acylated therapeutic betulin, showcasing that our approach is comparable to that of ozonolysis. We also wanted to test the scalability of our method. Using this substrate that we originally tested on a 0.5 millimole scale, getting a 78% yield, on our batch scale up to 10 millimole, we were able to get a comparable yield of 74%. The batch setup can be seen here featuring three lamps and two fans. Now with the scope completed, we wanted to get a better understanding for how this reaction was occurring. We began our investigation with a uv -vis study to figure out what the photoabsorbing species was. In purple, we have the alkene substrate at reaction concentration, followed by the green line, which is the nitrobenzene. The yellow line is both combined together. And as you can see, there is not much of a shift in wavelength upon mixing. What we would expect if this was an electron donor acceptor complex is a more extreme bathochromic shift to the right. Since we don't see this, we believe that the sole photoabsorbing species is the nitroarene, creating this triplet state oxygen-centered biradical species. To further support the triplet state formation, we tested some known triplet quenchers as well as hydrogen atom transfer probes. You can see that all of these to some degree suppress the reaction. However, 910 dihydroanthracene nearly shut down our reaction. And we believe that this is because we are doing hydrogen atom abstraction with our triplet state nitroarene to get anthracene, which we were able to detect by GCMS, which further supports that we are going through the oxygen-centered radical. So when it comes to our proposed mechanism, we believe that the nitroarene gets photoexcited then reacts with an alkene to give us that key dioxazolidine. But how exactly is that formed? We didn't exactly know, so we decided to move forward with a radical clock probe. We chose this alpha cyclopropyl styrene, where we made both cis and trans versions of the clock. What we found was that under our reaction conditions, the cis gives you a one-to-one -one trans to cis ratio of the starting material and only trans cleavage product, while the trans gives us three-to-one ratio and still only trans cleavage product. This makes sense since the trans cyclopropane is the thermodynamically more favored ring. We were not able to detect any of the expected ring open products. This can happen through a stepwise radical addition to the alkene, creating this cyclopropyl methyl radical, which then sequentially ring opens, then reforms the ring again, creating the scrambled stereocenter. 
We found further evidence for this non-stereospecific radical addition to the alkene with in-situ photo NMR done at minus 20 degrees Celsius with trans-beta methylstyrene. We saw the formation of trans and cis dioxazolidine. Here we can see in a time-resolved photo NMR the growth of two peaks almost in a one-to-one -one ratio belonging to those key protons on the formed heterocycle. Now that we knew how our dioxazolidine was formed after the excitation of the nitroarene, we still didn't know how the intermediate then fragmented to give us our products. It was hypothesized that there were two possibilities, a radical concerted mechanism or a polar stepwise mechanism. We decided to probe into these possibilities. But before we investigated the pathways, we wanted to know if the decomposition of the dioxazolidine was thermally or photochemically promoted. So we took cis cyclooctane, did another photo NMR experiment, and found that this cycloaddition adduct was stable over 22 hours at room temperature, as you can see by this concentration versus time graph in purple. We were able to isolate this adduct, then heat it to 60 degrees, where we were able to see a 41% yield of the dialdehyde cleavage product. This experiment told us that the decay of dioxazolidine is thermally promoted. We then took another portion of the dioxazolidine and subjected it to hydrogenation conditions, and we were able to get a 90% NMR yield of the dihydroxylated product that also was in a one-to-one -one cis to trans ratio. As I mentioned before, there are two possibilities for fragmentation, the radical pathway and the polar pathway. If the reaction went through a radical concerted mechanism, we would get a nitrine product alongside our carbonyls, which then could dimerize to give us an azobenzene, which Buki and I are detected under their UV light conditions. However, we were not able to detect any azobenzene in our reactions. To further disprove the radical pathway, we tested some nitrine traps, such as CH insertion, azeridination, and a couple azepine ring expansions with secondary amines and tetracyanoethylene. However, none of these nitrine products were ever detected. So if this reaction doesn't go through a radical pathway, then maybe it goes through a polar one. We decided to use one more in situ photo NMR experiment in hopes of monitoring the polar fragmentation intermediates. We used this tri substituted fluorinated styrene because we could track the reaction nicely by concurrent proton and fluorine NMR and compare the growth and decay of peaks. We did this experiment at minus 40 degrees Celsius. Once the light was turned on, you see rapid consumption of starting material and growth of what we believe to be intermediate one the dioxazolidine. As soon as the starting material was consumed, around five hours, we warmed the NMR to minus 20 degrees Celsius. And you can see immediate decay of that intermediate. We saw over the reaction course just a steady growth of the benzaldehyde product. We then saw what we believe to be a second dioxazolidine species. As you can see here in orange, it grew and decayed very similarly to that of intermediate one, even though it was at a smaller concentration. Another dramatic result of increasing the reaction temperature was the growth of this pink line, which is what we believe to be either the nitrone or oxazeridine byproduct. These byproducts have been documented to interconvert by photo excitation. Overall, this experiment showed us the formation and decay of not one, but two dioxazolidine intermediates, which if you recall from the beginning of this talk, mirrors that of the ozonolysis mechanism. Now putting all of our mechanistic data together in a complete proposal, we believe our reaction is occurring through photo excitation of the nitroarene which subsequently reacts with the alkene to produce the key dioxazolidine intermediate. The dioxazolidine then decomposes through a polar fragmentation pathway, which can go in either direction. If it went to the left, we would get this carbonyl imine and carbonyl, which then does a second cycloaddition event to give you a second dioxazolidine species that then fragments to give your carbonyl product and a nitrone byproduct. 
And if it fragmented the other direction, it would be exactly the same, except the opposite carbonyl product and nitrone. In summary, we were able to develop a safe, simple, and scalable alternative to ozonolysis without use of transition metals or photocatalysts. Our method occurs through a non-stereospecific radical addition to an alkene, resulting in the formation of a dioxazolidine species that then undergoes a polar fragmentation to eventually give us our carbonyl products. We were able to support this mechanistic proposal with the various studies shown in this talk, as well as others that I did not have time to mention. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching this video, and thank you, Matt, for inviting me to be featured on today's workshop. I want to thank my PI, Marvin Parisram, as well as the other co-first author on this paper with me, Dan Weiss, and the other authors, Wasim Hussein, Alana Duke, Josh Palilo, and Taylor Bakala. If anyone has questions, feel free to reach out by email. And once again, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Emma for joining us to share your chemistry. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.